In this video, I'm going to show you six reasons why the pipe method fixes all data frame code out there. Python notebooks really turn into a car wreck simply because of how people organize the code around their data. This leads to a lot of frustrations, not to mention broken pipelines and plain wrong analyses. By the end of this video, you'll see how preventable a lot of these common issues are because it really is one of those rare situations where just use this one trick really is the fix. So again, we're going to discuss six big features, but before going there, I need to explain what the pipe method does, how it works, and also the big problem that it fixes. So let's dive into some code. So let's start by showing you a car wreck that is about to explode. I'm reading in a data frame over here, and it's a pandas data frame, by the way. And long story short, there's two things I want to do with it. I want to make sure that this guilt column over here is just Boolean. If there's a missing value, it should be false. If there's an integer, it should be true. And I've also got some dirty values in this race column over here. And there's two cells below that totally address that issue. This first cell over here uses the column and then calls is null. And that gives you the right behavior. You can see that this is now a true false column. So that's nice. And then down below, I'm doing something roughly similar. I'm just using the race column over here, checking if its values are in the allowed list. And if so, uh, you're allowed to go through. But here is the epic thing that always goes wrong with data frames in notebooks. Notice how over here, the guilt column, it is doing what we want. It is true or false. But notice how the guilt column over here doesn't have that property. The reason why you don't see the change over here, but you do see it over here, simply has to do with the fact that the operations are in different cells and cells can run in different orders. I am running Marimo right now and Marimo actually comes with a safety mechanism against this and I'm doing something clever to avoid it. But the point remains, the thing that is hurting right now is that the order of the cells determines the order of the operations, and that can mean that unexpected stuff can happen. If you accidentally, for whatever reason, run the cells in the wrong order, the whole pipeline breaks, all your assumptions go away, and this leads to broken code with errors if you're lucky, and if you're not lucky, you just get analysis with the wrong conclusion. So this is something you really want to prevent. You don't want to rely on the order of the cells, this global variable that you're constantly updating, because the order at some point can bite you. You want to be able to control that. And this is where the pipe method will just fix everything because it's going to force you to write reusable functions instead. So here's a new cell. I have one function over here called sets types. I've got a different function over here called filter data. These functions can grow and become more expressive, but the main thing that they're really good at is they're good at separating concerns. This function is all about setting the types right, and this function is all about filtering the data such that we only have the stuff that we want. And what I can now do is I can apply these two functions onto this data frame get the result that I like. I can confirm that the guilt column has indeed updated. But the thing that's really nice is that I'm able to apply all of these functions without changing the original data frame. If I just call the data frame like so, you can see that the guilt column is exactly what it was before. So we don't have a global variable that's being changed all over the place anymore. That's already a huge win. But better than that, we also have nice functions that allow us to compose the big problem into smaller, more manageable chunks. And although the functions are nice, the pipe method makes them just slightly nicer because what you can now do instead is you can also say data frame dot pipe and then you can pass the data frame into a function. So you could do something like, hey, uh, let's first filter the data and let's then maybe set the types that's equivalent uh, to above. So this is equivalent to what we have below over here. The thing that's just really nice is that the pipe method allows you to read from top to bottom, left to right. So what I could also maybe do is uh, introduce some new lines here, right? Every line now represents a separate step. Um, but this is really nice and readable because you can really read this as take the data frame, then filter the data, take the data frame that comes out of that and then set the types. And it really feels like the data frame is a noun and all these separate functions are well understood verbs. And hopefully you can really see that if you just take all of your concerns and put them into separate functions, that you have a much better organization of your code and that you also have a less brittle pipeline, you're more easily able to debug things, and you just have a lot of organization. So that's already a big win. But if you're using this pipe method like this, there are also extra features if you know how to use them. So even though this already is a big step forward, you can actually go much further if you dive deeper. So I was using pandas before. I'm gonna to switch to polars now, but I do wanna point out that the pipe method doesn't just exist in pandas, the same exists in polars. In fact, you can also go to IBIS and also get the pipe method. Spark also has one. It's just that Spark calls it transform instead of pipe for some reason. But anyway, uh, let's continue now using polars. 
And I'm doing this on the same data set. So what you're gonna see here is that again, I have functions that do a thing that I like. So I've got this set types function over here. I've got this clean data function over here. Uh, after that, I also wanna sessionize the data. I wanna add sessions to these logs. But here's the thing with that sessionize function. The sessionize function is a little bit different than the rest because this actually comes with a keyword argument. It's a very relevant one because you wanna set the threshold as in when do we consider something to be part of the same session? When do we have to split it? That is something that is in the end variable. So that is something that you can declare, but here's a cool feature. If you have your pipeline, then you can also use those keyword arguments from here. So again, I'm setting the types, I'm cleaning my data, and then I'm definitely going to add a session. But if you wanna set the threshold of the way that you're gonna add this session, well, you're not forced to go back to your original function somewhere else in the code. You can choose to expose some of the behavior to the pipeline on this level. So that means that on a macro level, you can still give yourself some tuning knobs, but you can always dive in and change things on a micro level as well. And it's that separation of concerns. It's a little bit meta, but boy, is it useful. You can imagine, for example, that this might be a pipeline that we're gonna to use to filter out bots or something like that. And the way you filter bots probably depends on the way that you declare a session because the maximum length of a session could be a very strong indicator of a bot, right? But oh yeah, that depends on the threshold that you set over here. So that is not something you wanna have set in stone. That is something that you might wanna iterate over and play with. And just to point something out, another thing you can do is if you wanna have like a full pipeline function, if you wanna maybe have like the full pipeline, uh, that's something you can also do. Just have a data frame that goes in here. Again, you also allow yourself to set the threshold. And again, depending on how you wanna have your micro level, macro level set up, you can again do pipe, pass in a full pipeline, you still have access to the threshold, uh, but you can really organize your code differently simply because you can also expose these keyword arguments. It's something you should never forget, and people sometimes do. Given that you have a pipe method available, like one thing that is also just kind of a useful thing to keep in the back of your mind is you can also come up with utility methods that could help you debug. So for example, I'm now making a function called echo. So in this case, let's just do the simple thing. Let's just take the shape and let's just log that, right? And then we're gonna still return the original data frame, but at every single step, I now wanna be able to pinpoint and say, look, I just wanna know the shape. So in this particular case, hey, uh, before we clean the data and after we clean the data, can we just sort of print the shape over here? And then down below, you can see that these two numbers have printed and yeah, okay, we definitely seem to remove a couple of rows. It's kind of nice to have this information. In this particular data set, I might wanna go a step further because you might wanna know the number of individual player IDs, et cetera but you can come up with general functions that help you do anything with your pipeline and you can also use them in multiple places. This is one of those great moments when reusability really can go quite far. Now on the topic of reusability, I just gave the echo example, which is great if you're doing A analysis, but you can also start thinking about functions that you can use across multiple use cases. If you work, for example, for, I don't know, eBay or some sort of web store that has lots of web logs, well, then the ability to sessionize your data feels like something that's general that's useful for multiple pipelines. So maybe you wanna have a helper library with common functions that are useful all across your organization. Some transformation functions could be nice. Some functions that read in the data in a specific way could also be nice. But if you really wanna make sure that these functions are actually used all over the place, the best way is to make sure that they are compatible with a pipe method, because that way you can just click them in as if they're Lego bricks in a larger pipeline. Now, moving on to the next big feature, Instead of having helper functions, which definitely they're useful, you can also start thinking about helper decorators. And in particular, that echo function that we had that applied some logging, we can also upgrade it such that it becomes a decorator, which we can apply to every single pipeline function that we have. And there we go. I think something like this should do it. We run the function, then we take the name of the function and we take the result and we just return the shape of the result. You could go for something more elaborate, but one thing that's just kind of nice about doing this, let me just put it on top of the cell over here, is I can now add a decorator to all of these functions in general. And if I then also just briefly ignore the output, then you can see that, hey, yeah, this function, we had this many rows and eight columns, then we run this other function, then we have a different set of rows. Okay, that's quite interesting. You can also come up with logs that help you both debug, but adding logs to functions like this is also great when you're doing this in production, right? The only thing to really keep in the back of your mind here when you're doing things like this is first of all, the stuff that you wanna log for human readability in a notebook might be different than the way that your logging framework downstream might wanna have it. So that might be something to keep in the back of your mind. And then the second thing is that this mainly works for data frame types that are in memory. 
So you're going to notice over here that I'm running a function and I'm getting a result back. That works very well for most things, but for example, lazy frames in Polars do need a little bit of extra attention. So what you're doing inside over here definitely will work in general, but you might want to add an if statement such that the behavior for a lazy data frame is a little bit different. Lazy frames from Polars are super performant and using techniques like this is going to eat away at that because you are asking it to evaluate prematurely and the optimizer won't be able to do a lot of work for you. So definitely keep that in mind. But in general, I do think when you're just starting out with your pipeline, having a simple logger like this does go a long way. So definitely keep that in mind. This is also a great feature of the pipe method. Another thing you can also do if you're using the pipe method that people sometimes also forget about is that you can also be conscious about when you end the pipeline or put differently, you can also choose to just have these cached data frame variables. Now, when might that be useful? Well, in this particular case, it could be that the sessionize and this featureization step, that those are the expensive things to compute. So you really only want to do that once. If that's the case, then you can have that end result be cached into a variable like this. And then you can use that cached variable maybe with some sliders to change things around. So in this particular case, when I change the slider over here, this cell here updates. As you can see, there's a cell below here that responds to it, right? The only reason why this is so fluid is because it's a light computation, but it's only light because this one cached variable, quote unquote cached, is cached. And we are now at feature number five. And that is also something that blends quite nicely with Marimo notebooks, I gotta say. What you're able to do is you're able to take a function, maybe like this clean data function over here, and you can maybe write a test for it. So let's do test clean data. Let's start by constructing some sort of test data frame. This can just be a Polar's data frame with some values in it. And if I just have a quick look at the clean data function, I'm really just checking the class and race columns. So in this case, class foobar, that needs to be uh, filtered out, but a uh, hunter, that is something that will be fine. Uh, we can check the shape and the shape in this case should confirm that we only have uh, one row. So I could write a assert statement like this. We now have a nice little unit test. This is pretty neat. Now the thing with Marimo notebooks, and I gotta say, this is a somewhat recent feature, is that you can actually write your unit tests inside of a notebook as well. This cell over here just has functions that all start with test underscore. And that is something that we can then pick up. And then we will make the assumption that this is indeed a PyTest cell. And the output confirms that, right? You can see that this really just looks like a normal PyTest run. So I'm able to add PyTests in this notebook. Of course, what you can also do is maybe have a separate folder with separate files and have lots of tests. You don't have to put everything in a notebook. But the fact that you can add a few of these simple tests in your notebook as well is definitely kind of nice. But the main thing I want to get at is the fact that if you do have all these separate functions that are composable and stateless, then you can also quite easily write unit tests for them, which again makes your analysis a lot less brittle. All of this brings me to the final feature that I wanted to highlight when you're using the pipe method, and that is the fact that if you now want to take this to production, you're actually quite close. Functions are nice because you're able to add logs. Functions are also nice because they're easy to unit test. Not just that, if you're content with your notebook, you feel that everything is demonstrated working the right way, then you can also choose to reuse some of the functions that you've defined elsewhere. And again, this is a bit of a Marimo specific trick, but the main thing I want to get at is that you only have to write your functions once. If you write your functions this way during the analysis phase, there is no need to rewrite them into something more production worthy. You can just simply reuse what you already have. And that saves you a whole lot of time. And in particular, there's this one feature of Marimo that I do want to highlight in this one use case. Okay, so I'm back in the Marimo notebook. And what I did is I hit the command K shortcut to bring up the command palette. And then I told Marimo to add a new setup cell. What does that do? Well, a setup cell basically contains all the required components to start the entire notebook. And the main reason to use it is to just say, look, uh, my code depends on Polar, so that has to be loaded. With the setup cell around, what you're now able to do is you can make these cells that really only have one function in it. And the moment you do that, you're gonna notice that this is now designated as a reusable cell. You can see that there's this thing at the bottom of the cell over here, and that's a hint. That cell is now special because we now have a notebook that can actually expose this in a way that you can load it from other Python files or other Marimo notebooks. And it might sound strange at first, especially if you're a little bit more accustomed to Jupyter, but the logic here is that Marimo notebooks are stored as Python files under the hood. If I were to just to have a quick look, then this is what the file looks like internally. I have some dependencies on top, but you can see the setup cell that I declared earlier over here. That is now a context manager. You can also see that we've got these separate cells in the notebook. These are all decorated functions. 
And you can now see that the set types function and the clean data function that were all in their separate cells are now decorated with this app function. And long story short, this is a technique that we use internally to make sure that you could also import this one function if you wanted to. So as a demo to confirm that this actually works, uh, let's edit in sandbox mode, uh, foobar.py, that is the name of the new notebook. And from here, you can see from my utils, I have this set types that I'm importing, set underscore types, and a data frame can go in. And it's not just set types, I should have auto completion as well. So if I were to type session, there you go, sessionize. You can take everything that you've defined inside of a Marimo notebook. And if you do the setup cell, and if you make sure that you also have these cells that just have a single function in it, then you can declare all your code in the notebook, run your charts, make sure your analysis is correct. And if you then want to reuse that code for something more in production, well, it is all still in a Python notebook. So to reiterate everything here, this last feature over here was a bit of a Marimo specific thing, but the main feature, if anything, that this pipe method gives you, no matter if you're using pandas or polars or ibis or even spark, the main thing that this way of working gives you is that by adding tests and maybe also by adding a decorator for logging, you suddenly don't have to do much to turn that code into something that you can put into production. And if anything, that is the best feeling ever. Because I've seen it happen so many times that the notebook is just a mess, but the conclusion is there. And then you discover all of these weird artifacts when you start trying to get it to work in production. And all of that can just be prevented if you just take this pipe method as something that is almost sacred and something that you should chase. Because if you have modular functions, a lot of the problems really do go away. And there we are. End of speech. You can check the show notes for links to the documents. If you like this stuff, like and subscribe. And if you have questions, Ask them in the comments below.